Okay, well yesterday was a, a big day for us because we went into seeing that the key to happiness is really where we focus our mind, where we focus our, our memory, our use of memory. And as long as our mind is focused on the past, we are reinforcing a belief system of separation which does, does prevent us from experiencing consistent happiness or constant happiness. And so, you might say that the whole point of spiritual awakening is to become fully conscious. That as long as you have some beliefs that are hidden from awareness, they dictate your decisions. So you may think you are a human being making these free decisions every day of what to do, where to go, but actually it's this unconscious shadow that is dictating these decisions. And these decisions in a lifetime could be called the script of the world. And oftentimes human beings have a tendency as well to believe that they have free will. And free will is associated with the power of choice. But choice is a concept that was made up. There's no choice in heaven, there's no choice in nirvana, because oneness has nothing to choose between. It's just a state of pure beingness. So choice is a, is a concept that was made up, and as long as you have unconscious or hidden beliefs, then you might say choice is arrested. Arrested by the ego. Over there, like an ECU. It's arrested development. You might say that, that life, so called life in this world, is arrested development because it's being dictated by unconscious shadow beliefs. And there's no freedom in that. So that's why the goal is to become fully conscious or fully aware because as long as part of your mind is unaware, or we could say most of your mind, is unaware like the iceberg, then you can't experience that joy and freedom in a consistent manner. So, as we go deeper, we'll start to see that, um, that the energy of, of happiness and joy and love is so important. And I can really feel that with this gathering we're having. We're on top of the mountain, which is a nice symbol, bathed in sunlight, nice symbol, surrounded by Beautiful friends, lovely energy, beautiful music, and the little child uh, showing us, reminding us of the innocence, how excited he got during the, the, the it was like a chant almost, it was a prayer, it was calling upon the Holy Spirit and how energized he got from that. Which is really, that is what energizes us when we call upon the Divine and we feel that Divine flowing in us and through us. We, we have that wonderful feeling in our hearts, like, ah oh, yes, this is it. This is what I am. This is what life itself is. And then the ego is just this insidious unconscious belief system which, which could taint the, uh, all these amazing holy encounters with a little bit of hesitation. And, um, I really like the questions that came up yesterday because even questions about what do you do when, when the reflection suddenly turns from a happy reflection to something very dark. How do you deal with an angry person? Um, how do you deal with someone who seems to be very manipulative or deceptive? And I think the key we started to get at yesterday was, if you start to bring everything back, every experience back to the mind and to consciousness, then that is going to offer you the escape. For example, how would you deal with a manipulative person or a, a deceptive person? Well, you would notice that if you were emotionally triggered, it would have to be the deception within consciousness that is where the trigger is coming in. It can't really be that a person is deceptive. That's more on the surface of consciousness. When we get identified with being a human being, we certainly 
encounter what seems to be deceptive, manipulative people. But if we really say, oh, you know, I'm not going to just take the common sense of, oh, it's, it's them, and how do I deal with them, I'm going to bring it back to, uh, I just like to use the phrase, if you spot it, you got it. Uh, especially if you feel a reaction going on. If you spot it, then you've got it. If you perceive it, then you believe it. And it's just another mirror giving you an opportunity to say, hmm, maybe I should take another closer look at the roots of what I believe. Because it can't be that there's actually something outside of me that has the power to take my peace away. If Source created me as peace, if Source created me as love, then it can't be that there's some image, some event, some situation, some circumstance that can take it away. Peace of mind is not circumstance dependent. Peace of mind is neither caused by circumstances and events and people, nor is it taken away. So you can see all you're really doing is you're reclaiming the power of your, of your mind, of your consciousness, of your awareness. When you become centered in your heart, that's just another way of saying, let thine eye be single. And years ago, I know when I was growing up, when I was a child and when I was uh, in school, I loved maps and I loved graphics and I loved drawing things. So at some point, I did ask Jesus for a map of the mind. Give me a map of the mind, a map of consciousness, and he had me draw a bunch of concentric circles. And on, he said, now on the outer ring of the circles, that is your gross perceptual world. That's just this ever-changing world of images that are flickering by like shadows on a screen. Uh, and very much like a movie that you've given meaning to, and you call that life. You call that life on planet Earth, but that's just the outer ring of the mind, just the very outer reaches. And um, he said, underneath your perceptions are is a ring called emotion. So, you know, if if you have fear in your awareness, if you have fear in your consciousness, you still will perceive fearful events, fearful people. Because that ring of emotion is projecting that world that you see. He says, underneath this gross perceptual world, there's a ring of fear. And, you know, we grow up and we like to think that um, we, we love our, our love songs, we like the Coke commercial where everybody's holding hands and I like to teach the Lord to sing in perfect harmony. You know, we resonate with all of that. And yet, what we're told by the Master is basically <coughs> there's a ring of fear underneath. And these things that you call mountains and oceans and even the buildings and even the bodies and the people and the animals, everything, is projected out from this ring of fear. It's not love that makes the world go round. It's fear. And that's important. If we're going to heal, we have to get it straight. That was what, always what I was saying to Jesus was, get it to me straight. No color candy coating. Okay, I'm big enough now. <laughs> get it to me straight. So this, this ring of emotion is underneath the perceptual world. And he says you have but two emotions, one is love and one is fear. There's many derivatives, so peace, joy, happiness, so bliss, all things are derivatives of love and guilt and shame and pain and hurt and all kinds of things, jealousy, envy, on and on and on are derivatives of fear. So we need to purify that, that ring of emotion for us to see a peaceful world. We will not have a peaceful perception until we have harmony within. He says, when you want only love, you will see nothing else. Wow! That's the positive correlation of that ring. If you want only love, you will see nothing else. That's enough to motivate us to look inside and 
to purify the heart and to purify our thoughts and to have the Holy Spirit come and flood us, literally, or flood our mind with love and light. And we have to welcome, as the song said, we, we welcome you. The Holy Spirit is not like the sentinels in Matrix, <laughs> sent in on a search to destroy mission. You know, like this light going blazing, laser guns firing, zapping dark thoughts. No, it, it just doesn't work that way. Maybe in the movies, <laughs> the hero and the light, you know, battles against the darkness, but it just doesn't work that way in consciousness. Jesus says, uh, truth does not fight against illusions, nor do illusions battle with the truth. Illusions battle only with themselves. We have a projection of a fearful thought system and we see a battle going on. And it doesn't matter what the battle seems to be, no matter what scale, no matter what dimensions it are, from a world war all the way down to a mosquito bite. You might say that's like a, some people feel like they, when the bite comes in they're like, where is that mozzie? You know, it's like a, it's an affront to the person. How dare that mosquito bite me? There's a, it seems like a minor irritation, and a world war seems like a major thing, but there's really no degrees. And anything that's upsetting to your peace of mind is something that you need to heal. A little thorn in your side is not God's will. You know, even a little thorn sticking and prickling, a little prickler, is still not perfect happiness. And we are perfect happiness. We were created as perfect bliss and happiness. So there are no gradations to fear, and really no gradations to love. It's, it's an either or. So then I said, well, okay, so the fear, the, the ring of emotions is under the perceptual world. What's under the emotions? What causes the emotions? Cognition, thoughts. A lot of times in spirituality, there's artificial distinctions between the head and the heart, and the longest journey you'll ever take is the 13 inches between your head and heart, and da 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 Well, Jesus is a little more sophisticated, thank goodness. Uh, so we don't have constantly the heads battling the hearts. Uh, and the heads are usually tied in with rationality, and with thoughts, and, and concepts, and so forth. And the heart is usually where the is associated with the feelings. But in this sense, thoughts, they do cause what you feel. Your thought system, the thought system that you believe in, I'm getting down a little further, further there, because the beliefs are underneath the thoughts, but the thought system that you believe in determines your emotions, and therefore determines your perceptions. So thoughts and cognitions cannot be ignored in the equation because they're causative, and they cause your emotions. And this thought system of the ego, and the thought system of the Holy Spirit, really have no meeting point at all. They, they come from a different belief, they, they come from a different source. Uh, it's like when you bring darkness and light together, the light will remain. But these dark thoughts, these attack thoughts, have got to be raised up to awareness and raised up to the light, where they will disappear. So, the problem with thoughts and attack thoughts is hiding them. And that's why I would say communes, spiritual communities, like this, we, we have a, a community today, we have a commune of sorts today. We're all communing together with one purpose, and it's very holy. We're here to get underneath the surface because when we have emotions like anger or fear or guilt, there are thoughts that we're holding on to in our mind and we have not released those thoughts. And it is our responsibility to release those thoughts. How important is it to release those thoughts? Well, in A Course in Miracles, Jesus has a workbook with 365 lessons to take you to enlightenment or salvation. And the first 22 lessons of his whole mind training program, 
land on 23, which is, first 22 are only there for number 23. So 23 is quite important. He, he aims his first 22 lessons at number 23, and number 23 is, I can escape from the world I see by giving up a tax box. It's that important. He, the other ones are just preliminary. It's almost like they're just building, building, building towards a point of release. And that's really the key. If you can escape, the, if you can give up the attack thoughts, you do escape from the distorted perceptual world. So what's under the thoughts? The realm of thoughts, the ring of thoughts, is the ring of belief. You can actually believe things about your thoughts that aren't true which is kind of an interesting thing. And so an example of that is you can believe that your thoughts are ineffectual. And this is a common belief for human beings. Like, well there's a big vast world and cosmos out there and I've got some pretty crazy thoughts <laughs> whirling around in my little private mind, but, but those little thoughts don't really have any connection to that vast cosmos out there. Actually, they do. They're more than connected. They are identical. They are more than connected. They are identical. The thoughts that you think you think, not in reality, but the thoughts that you think you think in terms of the dream world, and the world that you think you see are absolutely identical. It's not even an inner and outer thing, even though it seems experientially to be that you're thinking thoughts and maybe you're not looking out and seeing anything that is too close to what you're thinking. You know, maybe having a, a bad day and even you have rage coming up and you have a thought that you would love to just kill somebody. And then you think, well, oh, but, but I'm not going to do it. Because we think there's a big difference between behavior and thoughts. It's one thing to think that, but it's another thing to act it out. Mm. That's another big distinction human beings make. It's one thing to think it, it's another thing to do it. No, actually, it's, there's no distinction. You will never make it back to heaven or nirvana thinking you want to kill somebody. <laughs> It's not like God and Jesus are at the gate going, well, you had a lot of times you thought of killing in a bird, but we're going to let that go. We're letting you in because you didn't do it. <laughs> Hitler did it, but you didn't. So we'll let you in. No, it's, it's that everything is unified. Everything I think and say and do teaches all the universe. So one unloving thought one scrap of attack, I mean one tiny scrap of attack, keeps you from knowing who you are. Keeps you from knowing your very identity. Because you were created as pure love, pure love, pure spirit. And anything short of that is just an illusion. It's just a trick meant to be released. So the belief is you can see with this ring, the perception is caused by the emotions, the emotions are caused by the thoughts, the thoughts are caused by the beliefs. Oh, Holy Spirit, tell me there's something underneath the beliefs. <laughs> tell me there's something at the core of my chart. The power of prayer, the power to free my mind, just as I seem to use it to imprison myself. Tell me there's something deeper still than beliefs. And that is prayer, that is desire. That's the power of prayer to free your mind. As Christ Jesus gave us an example of freeing the mind by desiring God. The two, first two commandments, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, and might. Love thy neighbor as thyself. You know, those are zooming us in to the core, what our desire is. And 
it's interesting that even a lot of the Ten Commandments, you know, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. Covet. I like to covet. Ooh. It's getting, we're getting beyond behaviors when we get into covet. We all know that too. <laughs> we deal with so many things and forms and behaviors, but coveting, wishing, what am I wishing for? Well, imagine that the center of your mind is like an altar, and when that altar is clean and clear and empty, then the glory of love, the glory of God can shine through when the altar is clear and clean. But when you put things on that altar, you put things before love. You take that power of that point of, of wanting, of desiring, and you put something else there, then that's what generates what we call the cosmos. And it's anything. It, it could be anything. I was using the example last night when we talked about prayer a little bit that um, we were going till I don't know, nine, nine something at night or ten, ten o'clock. And I was saying, well, if you, if you want a Snickers bar, the entire cosmos <laughs> wants a Snickers bar because there is no cosmos outside of, of you. You know, you're that powerful. It's kind of funny, they never make movies about that, where the whole cosmos wants a Snickers bar, and, and someone's got to come in to save the day. Um, uh, you're talking about lust, well what about lust for the Snickers bar? You know, that would be really funny, you know, to think, the Holy Spirit saves the day. But, but what is it, let thine eye be single? It's talking about unified, unified desire. And what is unified desire except creation. Wow! That's like the portal that takes the mind back into the blazing light of creation, the great rays, the light of heaven, the pure, abstract, unconditional, loving light that is our very being. That desire becomes the portal in the sense that when you let thine eye be single, when you have only, we'll say, love on the altar, or only God, when, when your unified awareness, when your unified desire is there, then creation is, is where the journey ends. Or we might say better that where you see that there really was no journey. <laughs> you, never, you never left, you never went anywhere. You've always been that love. So, what we can talk about today, too, is in the context of everything I've just shared, when there is still a wish for separation, then what you have is a lot of defense mechanisms. And certainly, that's what the field of psychology and the field of psychiatry has been, has shown us over this, these last decades, is it's told, showed us about defense mechanisms. That there are so many ego defense mechanisms, and the ego is protecting itself from being exposed to the light. It seems like it's against people, you know, we can say, well, stop projecting onto your husband, or stop projecting onto your wife, or your boyfriend or girlfriend, um, or repression and denial. We can describe these mechanisms, but uh, it's really just the ego, with its tricks, trying to protect itself from healing release. It's just this one little puff of nothingness. And I say puff of nothingness because it wasn't created. God didn't create it, so it's, it truly is a puff of nothingness. It's been called a tiny mad idea. Uh, it's been called a, an idea that the Son of God remembered not to laugh at. So, you might say there's only one serious idea to do with this whole world, and it's the ego. And we give it a name just because we want to be practical in exposing it and releasing it. Not that it has any kind of reality. Their psychology talks about ego dynamics when you study psychology. And Jesus puts the word dynamics in quotations. Because how can something that doesn't even exist have dynamics? <laughs> oh yeah, I've got a real dynamic 
puff of nothingness going on. <laughs> we never hear dynamic nothingness. How was she? How was the she was dynamic nothingness? <laughs> just the two words don't go together at all. But we want to expose everything in a very authentic way and not hide anything. It reminds me of the number one question that I get asked around the world as I go to these different countries. It always comes down to the number one question. How did this happen in the first place? <laughs> if everything is perfect love and oneness, then how did we get duality? How did we get multiplicity? How did we get conflict and war out of love? It just doesn't seem like that would follow. And one of the ways I like to address it is, imagine yourself as being one of the first two Course in Miracles students on the planet, and you're literally scribing and, and taking down the book, and you're going chapter after chapter after chapter, and at one point, these first two human beings, to, to touch this uh, Divine Scripture, they basically, they said to Jesus, pardon, pardon, can we just ask, I don't know how many chapters in they were. Just one tiny little question, please. How did this happen in the first place? And Jesus' answer was, well, you can tell by how you feel, and you can tell by the roller coaster of emotions that you experience, a part of the human condition, that you believe that it did happen. Interesting. You can tell by how you feel that you believe that it did happen. He was just speaking in general to all human beings, saying, well, I can tell you it's not real, but <laughs> you believe it. Almost like we have things called self-fulfilling prophecies, and Pygmalion, and a lot of examples throughout history of how powerful consciousness is, the mind is, and you drawing forth witnesses to something that you believe, when actually you don't really have all the evidence to make a conclusion that fear is real. Jesus is saying, if you will come with me and examine the evidence very carefully, <laughs> and and come with me and, and follow my lines of reasoning, then you will have an experience that only love is real. And that's another thing about artificial distinctions. A lot of time in spirituality, rationality gets a bad name. Oftentimes the rational mind is associated with the ego. Mm -hmm. Not so. Mm -hmm. Not so. Actually, anybody who knows about philosophy knows that in a philosophical phrase, of if A and B then C and so forth, you find that there is a line of logic, but that everything depends on your first premise. Every logical outcome depends on the first premise. And the Holy Spirit has a very different first premise than the ego. The ego's is basically, all is fear, and the Holy Spirit's first premise is, all is love. So actually, rationality is not really working against your awakening, it's actually working for your awakening, if you are careful enough and, and willing enough to follow, to trust where this is going. He will say, there's a first premise. And we were talking about that yesterday, that divine innocence, original innocence, is the premise of the Holy Spirit, and original sin is the premise of the ego, and they will take you into very different experiences, depending on which one you focus your mind on. If you are determined to find original innocence, you must define, you must find it because it's there. <laughs> In fact, it's the only one that can be found. You could never actually find original sin, because it's really nowhere to be found. It's like there's a veil, and you go past this puff, and then 
the ego says, don't ever lift this final veil because God will strike you dead. And the Holy Spirit says, let's lift the veil together <laughs> because there's only light and love behind the veil. So that's the journey that we take. And we were talking this morning, Nikita and I were talking about the subtleties of letting go of protecting the ego. Because sometimes human beings will do some pretty crazy things. Under the name of protecting feelings. Under the guise that I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. Sometimes human beings will seem to tell lies. And sometimes they're even called little white lies for us. I didn't want to hurt their feelings. I wasn't going to tell them the truth because the truth hurts. You see, if you follow that line of thinking, the truth hurts, then you would protect someone from the truth. Whereas we're saying it's important to not protect the ego and expose false thinking and go on an authentic spiritual journey where you come into a state of integrity where you can let the Spirit speak through you from a place of certainty, from a place of clarity and realize that you don't really have the power to upset anyone. That's just another ego belief that you have the power to upset other people. And that's a big one, in the sense that, as long as you believe that, you seem to be walking emotionally and psychologically on eggshells, afraid to say what you need to say. Say what you need to say! <laughs> you know, we have all those songs. You, you will let it come out, you will let it express and extend. Because it's coming from strength, it's coming from clarity, it's coming from certainty. And Jesus, again, is an example of that. He, he spoke from clarity, he spoke from gentleness, he spoke from meekness, and it seemed like the people around him took offense to some of his words. In fact, some would seem to be greatly offended. Until it grew to the point after three years that there was a mob that said, Crucify him! <laughs> they were so offended they, want, they wanted him dead and out of there. And yet, all he was doing was extending love. So, that's an important thing to remember on the spiritual journey, that it may seem as if people perceive and take offense at love. But it's just that the ego is offended. Love never offends. Love doesn't have the power or the capability to offend, it's just the ego is offended. And I think most everyone here in the room has experienced that when you've gone on your spiritual journey, there seems to be the naysayers. Mm -hmm. There seems to be the, the, those that show up and say, what are you doing? That's crazy. You're wasting your time. You're often foolish pursuits that will get you nowhere, and so on and so forth. And those are just the doubt thoughts of the ego coming up, floating up into awareness. It's not really them that are telling us these things, it's our mind still believing in two thought systems and as we're going through the purification process, we're letting some of those attack thoughts percolate up to the surface of consciousness and they seem to get acted out in the characters. And they seem to get acted out in the environment as well. But, but all is well if we just start to realize that we just have to let them come and let them go. They can't really hurt us. They can't really take away peace. So I mentioned this movie yesterday uh, called Fifty First Dates. I think most everyone has seen Fifty First Dates. I love to use parables where people all have seen them. Because uh, I think Nikita has some clips that we could watch. One. One, one clip. Protectionism. So, yeah. You want to share a bit about it? 
I don't know you don't remember? anything about okay. the movie, other than I heard that it was good conversation okay. and something about protection. Yes. I've never seen yes. actually myself the movie, but so and I just only found one. Yes. Is that under the name protection? So it okay. has to be the one. Well, it'll be the one. We'll watch it. And this clip, I don't know if I'll just jog your memory a little bit about Fifty First Dates, but um, the character Lucy, played by Drew Barrymore, she has in her has she has had a car automobile accident where she swerved and she hit a tree head on and she had a head injury, pretty the world would judge it a very serious head injury, and so she has a memory problem. And this movie is so great because you can see how this relates to the human condition. Uh, the human the human race had a had a, a collision, <laughs> and it seemed to be a pretty big collision, and uh, it's got a memory problem, which we discovered yesterday. It can have serious seeming consequences, this uh, memory problem, by taking such a powerful mind and focusing on a mistake, instead of focusing on the correction, and reliving that mistake over and over and over, like Groundhog Day. Lucy is living her same day over and over because she's had a, a head injury. We, we could say that, okay, we'll say the, the sleeping son of God had a mind injury. <laughs> there was a collision somewhere, supposedly, and there's a mind injury going on here, and there's a memory problem, distorted memory. Um, there's definitely some amnesia going on. Uh, with, with the human race. It's like an amnesia of love. We get little flickers coming through, but it's not enough to break through the, the what seems to be a pretty total amnesia, because love doesn't really come in bits and pieces. It's, it's an eternal state of mind. So if we're not aware of it, then that's, that's the amnesia. But what's fun in this movie, I actually went to uh, Oahu where they filmed this movie, and uh, I said, could you take me to that shack? I want to go see that shack <laughs> where, you know, she's got makes the waffles, little houses out of waffles, and the guy with the big cleaver, and uh, what is it? They have spam, spam and eggs, and there's spam there, and all this stuff. And they said, no, they just built that shack for the movie, and they, oh. they took the shack down. There's no shack. There's no place. But. There's the characters in the restaurant are quite protective of Lucy. They don't talk to her about what happens. They're, they're trying to protect her feelings. She's being mollycoddled. She's being, she's being pampered. She's being handled with kid gloves. And human beings have a tendency to do that. Human beings don't like hurt and anger and injury. They, they want to stay in pleasantries and make it all nice. But it doesn't always heal things when we try to make it all nice. Even if we had a wound on our skin and we, we were so concerned about the wound that we said, I'm just going to protect that. I'm going to put a cast <laughs> on it. <laughs> this overprotection would what? It would, it would prevent it from healing, because it would prevent the oxygen, it would prevent the sunlight, it would prevent the scab from forming, if you put a tight cast on the top of a wound. And that's emotionally what is going on with relationships a lot of times, is we're, we're so concerned about losing the love, or making waves, or causing ripples in relationship, that we, we cover over, we protect. So not only in this movie clip will we see that that the, the some people at the little shack, the restaurant where she has breakfast, are protecting, but but her father and her brother are protecting. Instead of you know sitting down and saying, "Honey, there's just a funny thing going on with your memory, and you had a bad accident, and." We're, we're, we love you, there's all these people that are here, 
people at the hospital, we're all here to love you and everything, but, but there's some distortions going on with the memory. Instead of doing that, they have adapted and adjusted to her memory problem. And that's what's going on with the human condition, the human race. Everybody's so concerned about disturbing someone else that they're pleasing and adapting and adjusting. And they're, it's like that, that uh, old story about uh, the emperor who has no clothes. It takes a little child to finally go, he's not wearing any clothes, when everyone else in the society is playing the game, pretending that we're not going to say anything about him being naked. It's not good to talk about naked. So they pretend that he's okay, pretend he's normal. And there's a lot of pretending things are okay, things are normal, and there's not a lot of acknowledgement about the seeming separation from God or the fall from grace. There's just, there's a lot of positive thinking, almost as if we put enough creamy white icing on top of this fall from grace that maybe it'll go away, you know. And what we realize is we, we have to start exposing in a very direct, open way. Imagine, I think maybe I'll be able to show this clip too, there was a a clip called The Invention of Lying. Did anybody see the movie Invention of Lying? The characters in The Invention of Lying, they cannot, um, they, they, they have to speak their thoughts. And so everybody is candid. You can imagine that what, what that would do to dating and everything else <laughs> if you went on the first date and you, it's almost like you had dating Tourette's. <laughs> where you have to speak all of your thoughts on the date without censorship. Um, that's another good clip, we'll try to show that one too, but that's the reason that there's so much hiding that's going on is because people don't want to reveal these attack thoughts that are still in there. They feel like that's not going to help the relationship and it's not going to help you get a second date. If you, if you reveal your attack thoughts on the first date, don't expect get a phone number or a callback, no callback. You, I'm going to reveal my shadow on the first day. People don't do that. But that's kind of the human condition and a lot of hiding and protecting that's going on. So in this movie, it's, it, Adam Sandler has kind of turned it into a comedy, but it's really profound because it's really for all of us to start to say, we need to be authentic. We really need, there's too much pressure and trying to hold back and hold it in. And it's more like saying to yourself and to your brothers and sisters, can we not agree that we need healing? Can we not agree that we shouldn't hide and protect these dark thoughts? Because how are we going to learn they're not real if we keep pretending they are and, and hiding them because we believe they're real? How are, how are we ever going to have a, a free mind did you ever play, what was that, um, that movie, Ghost in the Graveyard? It was a movie, it was a, it was a game we played, but at the end it was Ali Ali, income free. Everyone comes in free at the end. Everybody can stop the hiding. That's really when we're asking the Holy Spirit to flood us today, that's what the Holy Spirit is saying. Ali Ali, income free. Everybody comes in free. I'm not holding anything against you. Nothing you've ever said or done is held against you, it's time that we can just stop the game. <laughs> we won't play the game of hide and seek. It was a, a movie called The Bad Seed. The Bad mm -hmm. Seed. Yeah, I don't know, it's not a movie. It was a black and white. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Remember? Yeah, yeah. evil girl. Mm -hmm. And so then in the end, everybody that was in the play, mm -hmm. you know how they used to do it? Mm -hmm. you, You'd come out and bow after your performance, mm -hmm. like as if just an act, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's like a, a thing in theater. Mm -hmm. Even the ones that, that play the villain, yes. they yeah. come out and they take a bow, uh -huh. and everyone cheers yes. for the performance. Mm -hmm. But no one's fooled. And if we could do that in our relationships, imagine somebody's just blown up at you, and they just listen. And they just scream and everything, and you just go, 
Oh, bravo. That's just so good. That just is the best angry, evil, raging person I've ever seen. Come on, everybody. Let's everybody get an answer. Imagine that you actually could do that. And imagine how you would set everyone free. You would you would set the captives free with that if nobody took it seriously. That was almost convincing. <laughs> right, right. That's almost. That was almost convincing. <laughs> it was such a good act. So, because really what you're doing, and like I said, if you start to see that there's not really an external world, it's just your thoughts. Imagine you could say that to those raging thoughts. Mm. Thank you for sharing. Ooh, good villain. <laughs> Not me, <laughs> but it's a good villain. I don't buy it, but it's a good villain. You know, there's a there's a freeing. You're releasing the hold that your mind has. It's, it's a joke. Yeah, it's a joke. Yeah. Jesus even uses the word joke in the Course of Miracles. It's fun to hear joke. The word joke come from Jesus Christ. He says, is it, it is a joke to think that time could come to circumvent eternity. You see, his, his happiness is always coming from an eternal state of mind. That's what makes it a joke, is that a parenthesis in eternity that Joel Goldsmith talked about. You can't put a parenthesis in eternity. It's a joke to think you can try to circumscribe it. Okay, let's this is a one clip, one clip of 50 first takes, and I think it's it's segmented here. It's just like a little, uh, like a little mini movie, tiny, tiny. This is why in relationships, when you try to smooth things over and please things and adapt and adjust to what someone else is thinking, or you believe someone else is feeling, or whatever. I call that people pleasing, and the bad day will come. Yes. The bad day will come because it's 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 like trying to go against the healing laws of the whole universe by adapting and adjusting to a lie and believing that that adjustment to the lie is <coughs> compassion. Mm -hmm. You see how sneaky the ego is, because mm -hmm. if if it can get you believing that you're being compassionate by protecting other people, by protecting people's feelings, and so forth. Anybody knows the value of, of intentional communities, the value of open communication, the value of having friends that will tell you things from their heart, and not tell you what they think that you want to hear, but because they love you, tell it to you straight, and say, you might want to take a look at this, you might want to take a look at that. Those are angelic reflections of dear close friends bringing the Holy Spirit through them and, and messages to your mind about how you have to heal. And there actually is a lot of darkness that has to come up. Why would you keep pushing it down? Why would you keep covering it over, trying to make a pretty, pretty world, you know, when actually the ring of fear is still not been exposed? and it's, you're going to have to face the ring of fear sooner or later. You want to become fully conscious. You want all the darkness to come up so you can let it go out. The parallel in this world is like if, if anybody has ever seemed to have the flu and you know that feeling of the, the upcheck coming mm -hmm. where you try as you may to hold it down and you realize it's, that's not a strategy that is going to work. Even though you may seem to delay it a little bit, it doesn't, you can't. You, it's part of the, the seeming healing of up and out. That's very symbolic of how it works in the, with the emotions in the mind as well. So we're seeing here, at this point that we just saw, the gig is up, so to speak. The whole game of pretense has collapsed. And think how many romantic comedies are based on the same formula. They, the people come together and they try to adapt and adjust to each other so they can fall in love. It's almost like a contrived way of trying to fall in love through hiding and protecting. Mm -hmm. And then at some point, that's always part of the formula, the big blow up comes. And then the big forgive, forgiveness comes. We see those 
movies over and over and over where the blow up comes and then the forgiveness comes. So and the here, sex. yeah, yeah. It can, and the makeup sex or something, and then it just it will recycle and recycle and recycle until there's another big blow up. So as we see in this movie, now that the lie has has been exposed, about really the cover up has been exposed. Now we're going to see that the wound has to be exposed as well. And then there's a reinterpretation and a healing that has to come in the mind from reorienting and reinterpreting once that wound is exposed. But as long as no one's talking about the wound and no one's even acknowledging the wound, then it's just projection, people pleasing, protectionism, that's what this whole world is. Even when such things are brought up like terrorism, as if you're going to try to hunt external terrorists with uh, weapons and putting terrorists in prisons and everything. You see the whole system of this world is backwards and upside down. The terrorist is the ego in the mind. <laughs> it's these dark thoughts, these attack thoughts that are buried in the subconscious mind. That's the terrorist. And the way that you heal it is expose it and see that it had no real effect. It was just, you were drawing forth unreal effects and circumstances while you still believed in it. And then when you let it go and no longer believe in it anymore, amazingly the whole world heals. The whole world lights up. So this is a good example. We'll keep going here with Lucy. So Adam Sandler is, is symbolic of the Holy Spirit. Now he gets a hold of the scrapbook. It's the same images, it's the same photos you know, that are part of time and space, but now it's just going to have a new purpose. Exposing, healing, integrating. I'm sure some of you have done the same thing I did, where, you know, I went through back my old scrapbooks. My family took a lot of photographs back in the day. Nowadays, like my sister with her kids, she videotaped every, every birthday, everything, you know, they can basically go watch their life. <laughs> every, watch their faces, the nuances and how they were looking in every scene. But it's basically the Holy Spirit using the symbols to say, okay, we need to bring this in awareness. We have to break the repression and the denial about the wound and allow the wound to come up in the context of we're here to love you and support you. And what this is, is the reason that in relationships that people hide so much, even in intimate relationships they will keep a lot of aspects of their mind private. Because it's the fear of abandonment, it's the fear of rejection, it's the fear of being turned away from. You know, the, the mind is so accustomed to hiding and protecting these thoughts, because it it's covering over a lot of deep unworthiness. Mm. And every human being has this deep pool of unworthiness, like I'm not really worthy of love. Mm. So that when you have a partner or something, and you, it's kind of like there's a part of the mind going, imagine that, a partner that's with me or something, because it's so dark, there's so much unworthiness down there. And to keep the partner is to keep, in the ego sense, to keep those dark parts hidden. Even though it just doesn't work that way in relationships, those dark parts, they come up. They are designed to come up. The whole healing system is to let the darkness come up. And, and it seems like we're doing this with relationships, but it's really just our mind is allowing this stuff up, so we can have it reinterpreted by the Holy Spirit. Because in the end, the darkness isn't real. Why isn't it real? Because God didn't create it but we believe it's real. We hide it, and then we keep our uh, relationships more on a surface level, because, uh oh, I don't want to go too deep, because it could trigger the dynamite that's underneath, that, that out-of-control part that's, that, that feels very psychotic, or very schizophrenic. <laughs> it's almost like that part that's hidden. Because you don't want that up too much, otherwise you might not be deemed to be a fully functioning, adult, mature human being. You could lose the title. <laughs> you could become one of the sick ones. Pretty quick. Pretty quick, the diagnosed <laughs> ones. 
and then the locked up ones, you know, so there's a whole scenario in there that's tied into this hiding and protecting. But we can see here now, Adam Sandler, he's just taking it home and he's, he loves her and he wants to be able to reach her in a way that's authentic, so that the love can grow and blossom and can be really true, deep, authentic love, not this kind of game playing uh, that, that takes so much energy. We all know that, it's just, it just takes enormous energy to play the game. The brother is a great representation of the ego voice, because even though he must be exhausted from doing it the way they've been doing it, yeah. as soon as somebody tries to show him a better way, he's like, our way is fine! <laughs> right, right. <laughs> exactly how the ego right. turns and talks. Protecting it, right. Exactly. Even all that work. We're doing fine here, this, yes. is, this is a great plan. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, that's our family system, like, don't, you're an outsider, don't mess with our family system here, and the spirit... Even the way he's protecting yeah. is such ridiculous, he has painting the wall every single night, and watching that movie every single night. <laughs> To not upset her feelings. Because yeah. we love her. Yeah, because we love her, we don't want to upset her. And th that thing goes on in all kinds of relationships, parent-child relationships, many relationships. And it's almost like we just don't trust that, that letting all this up and clearing all this out will take us back to the light. We think from the ego's perspective, that we're just going to be lonely, and grow old, and have no friends, <laughs> and have no family, and be a bag lady, be homeless, you know, the ego is saying, oh yeah, right, expose your thoughts and your feelings and see where this goes. And it's got a whole scenario in our mind, instead of having expanding circles of mighty companions that are all authentic with us, and keep allowing us to keep exposing and, and going higher and higher in consciousness back to the light, the ego paints this very dismal thing, like you will pay for this the rest of your life, and you will end up cold and lonely and living desolate, in living in your car. <laughs> yeah, picking out of you know, that, those things are in there. So here we go, he's gonna, he's gonna turn the tables here. Okay. So that that's great to, to start to realize what see the videotape seemed to be in here were playing over and over to give a context for the healing is really what an authentic spiritual path is. It doesn't really matter what the form of your path is, but you need to be reminded of the context of this awakening. Otherwise it's too easy to get lost into the the ways of the world, just to get lost into serving time on planet Earth, between morning and night. Working a job, doing all the things you have to do, survival, and trying to pack in some excitement to counteract the boredom of the human condition. And so, the videotape is really like this sense of, oh, remember, it's a sign of hope, it's a sign of Okay, we're not going to let go of this deep undercurrent that has to be brought up, you know. We're going to expose the shadow every day, and get into the joy of exposing the shadow. Start to see that that's actually the point of all of our relationships, is exposing the shadow. Even friends can't help you in this journey, unless it's the purpose underneath the friendship that's for awakening. And we've all had that experience, when you come to some really important points in your life, there's crossroads, and friends can, can either speak from the ego, or they can speak from the spirit. They can speak from fear, and say, be careful, that's dangerous, don't do it, I wouldn't do it, da, da, da. or they can speak from the encouragement of the spirit, like, go for it. I'm right there with you, I'm right behind you. You see, that's why we have to so get in touch with the Spirit. We need this mind training, we need this focused programming of transferring our thoughts from attack thoughts to those thoughts of joy that are, that are underneath. The thoughts of joy and love are always there, they're still in our mind, but they're so covered over by these attack thoughts that we have to 
have that. And really, that should be your, your question in terms of relationships, like, who's in your life, who do you surround yourself with on a daily basis, it's like, do they support your awakening? That's the, the choice of a spouse, do they support my awakening? Forget all the ego reasons for having a spouse. Forget all the ego reasons for having a boyfriend or girlfriend. Do they, will this support my awakening? Are we in agreement that there's a mirroring going on here? Are we in agreement that we have, a, we share a huge need to have this darkness exposed? And you see how much faster it's going to go when you have that agreement. And if you don't have that agreement, then you're still playing the game. Did I do enough, or will you leave me? You see, it's, it's still pressurized, it's still dependent. And also this idea that relationships have to be so fixed. I'll let you in on a big secret. People aren't really people. What? They aren't. <laughs> really. People are thoughts. People are thoughts. And when we start to think in terms of relationships, we put a lot of pressure on to maintaining something. But imagine if you had a very dark negative thought that just kept showing up in your life over and over and over. You know, then you have to start to say, if people are thoughts, then why is this thought reoccurring in my mind and in my dream? You see, because it's, it's obviously there because it's still desired. If desire is our core, we must still want it, even if we're not consciously aware of it, we must still want it. And therefore, that's why it's so important to be able to speak it, to say, this is what's important to me in my life, this is what I want in my life, and I'm not going to compromise and just play, pick a part, pick a role, play the role out over many years, uh, all for some scraps of something that could be, uh, feel good in this life, because the ego has ways of inventing lots of feel-good emotions that are actually part of fear. And when we stay addicted to those feel-good emotions that are part of fear, we stay addicted to the fear itself. And then it's, it's very much uh, what Jesus says, the secret of salvation is but this, you are doing this to yourself. That's, it can seem like tough love, but it's actually wonderful love. It's actually saying, no, this is the law of karma, this is the law of all that I give is given to myself, giving is receiving, you know, it's, it's the divine law that's being exposed to our mind, which everything operates out of, so we're not, we're not an exception to that divine law. And therefore, it hearkens us back to the Bible, as you sow, so shall you reap. That's a pretty important divine law. Once we understand that it's going to free our mind and not imprison it. If, it's, if we give it over to the ego and we just say, well, I believe in the ego, I believe in fear, so I'm destined to be fearful, then that's saying that you are you have no choice but to be an ego, but an ego is not who we are. We're divine love, so when we give ourselves focus over to that purpose, healing, forgiveness, then we draw forth those witnesses. So this is amazing stuff because it's very freeing for the mind. Is it personal gain if it... I, I just wanted to have you speak. Because yeah. so often I think I'm getting into a relationship, or I think I'm doing something, and it falls flat, or it didn't work out, I think, well, I had some personal gain here that I was motivated. Yeah, yeah, that's very subtle. Kay's asking about personal gain, but, but as long as we have a belief that we could gain something for ourself, personally, and for ourself alone, um, what comes with that in the ego scheme is that others must lose for someone to gain. You know, the ego just isn't into this win-win-win 
um, everybody gains, everybody's blessed by every loving thought. That's the Holy Spirit is saying, every loving thought you have blesses the whole universe. And as you forgive and heal, you're healing the whole universe. It's a huge thing, but it is this sneaky ego ploy that, that somehow wants to believe that, that there's a specialness going on, and there's a uniqueness to the human being, and that it's good to be special and unique, and that it's good to gain at the expense of others. You hear that a lot of times in, in politics, you know, that's just the way it is. Some must gain, even though others will lose, and then it's good that those ones gain, because somehow that's supposed to benefit everyone, with losers, I, you know, it's crazy. Sometimes you hear it in political circles, and those ideas reflected back. But, um, imagine if you really had the context that every single decision you make in your life is either blessing the whole, or it's, it's a decision for an illusion. Every decision without exception. And Jesus does say that decisions are continuous, but you are not always aware you are making them. So, this unconscious mind thing, it's, it's, it's pretty devious stuff, because you've heard of stories where like, uh, uh, parents will get divorced, and then the child, maybe we'll say the child's like four years old, and the parents get divorced, and then 20, 30, 40 years later, that child is in therapy, talking to his therapist about, I still think I had something to do with my parents' divorce. If I hadn't done this, and said this, and so forth, my parents would not have divorced. You see how the tendency of the mind is to take on the guilt, to take on the blame. And those are not, not like a four-year-old is consciously thinking, hmm, I'm making mom and dad get divorced, but if that belief is down there, pushed down in awareness and everything, then that can be pushed down and has to come up, maybe years later through therapy or some circumstance, but it's still there. So, when decisions are pushed out of awareness, they become beliefs. They are no longer questioned whether their validity is true, they are believed to be true. It's very sneaky to think decisions pushed down. And then there's an amazing line that Jesus says in the Course. He says, because this involves decision. You know, I was saying earlier there's no free will, and, and we think that these are real choices on the surface of consciousness. He says, a decision is a conclusion based on everything that you believe. So the decision is not going to be free, it's not going to really be a free choice until you raise the shadow up into conscious awareness. And when you do, it's more like when they studied the yogis and the mystics, where the yogis can, can, can control their heart rate. Some of the things that were thought to be involuntary are actually under control of mind and consciousness when they do the studies of the yogis. Because they simply raise their unconscious mind up, it's all their mind training, and they, they can actually choose to slow down their heart, choose to speed up their heart. But even more, think about Paramahansa Yogananda, who, who made a conscious decision when to lay the body aside, and it stayed laying in a state of non-decay for weeks. Talk about conscious, you know, these are great examples of raising the darkness up so that you consciously are choosing, and, and you're choosing in love, ultimately, if you release the unconscious mind. A lot of times people think, well, nobody's really in charge of, for example, how they're going to die, or, or when they're going to die, but Yogananda misproved that as well. <laughs> You know, everything is a choice, whether the mind is aware of it or not. Absolutely everything. And not just in your personal life, everything in the entire cosmos, throughout all of history, is a choice. 
And it's all leading to a choice to escape the world and return to nirvana or heaven. And so atonement is what Jesus calls it. That's what everything is funneled towards. So then suddenly your life has such a glorious purpose, like, oh my gosh, that's what I'm here for, is to accept atonement. I'm, I'm here to accept the correction for the error of separation. And it's stating it very clearly, and it's like, wow, every day. Imagine making a video for yourself, like, like the Adam Sandler character made for Lucy, and every day reorienting your mind, like, oh yeah, this is really important. It's not like the Beat, the Beatles song, do, 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 it's just another day. I mean, no, this is the day when I'm going to wake up. This is the day that is the most wonderful, exciting day in my life, when I reclaim the power of my mind, when I reclaim my power of choice to choose correction, instead of blindly walking through error, believing that things are just happening to me, that are beyond my control. That's probably the, the saddest aspect of the human condition, is the belief that there's all these external forces and conditions that are outside of you, that are twisting and determining how your state of mind is going to be. I'm a victim. Yeah, like a victim, at the mercy of a vast external world. And how exciting to think that we are here to support each other for a brand new way of living. You know, we don't know what form that will take. Um, I never could tell the way, the direction, the form of the life of David was going, but I, I valued equality, I valued open communication, I valued respect. I valued uh, having ideas shared and allowing a whole group of ideas to be shared, trusting that there was a presence among me and my brothers and sisters that was strong enough to carry us all through, instead of trying to turn away and take stances and take sides and make walls and make boundaries that we could actually learn to live in harmony by having a free flow and a free exchange and, and you might say, expression of, of ideas. Even a free chain, exchange and expression of, of emotions, that with this monastery that we have, Living Miracles Monastery, that every day there's points where some things come up in expression sessions, where somebody is going through something dark, and it's really everyone's opportunity to see the nothingness of that darkness, and to extend love. So these are not gossip sessions, these are not kind of sessions where you try to, to put the blame on somebody. These are opportunities to say, wow, there's a lot of deep, intense emotions down there, and they do need to be allowed up into the surface of consciousness. And isn't it loving for myself and others to let that happen? Mm -hmm. Gosh, that's so progressive. It's very progressive. Oh. And, and then it starts to build a momentum, where people start to feel like it's safe. It's a safe haven, it's a safe place to express those emotions. It's a safe place to get angry. If, sometimes they're not even aware of all that's going on, they just know that the, she's going to blow, there she blows, <laughs> you know. You may have like 45 peaceful days in a row, and then, there she blows, you know, and it just comes blasting up like the volcano erupts. To know that it's safe, that you haven't ruined anything, that you haven't wrecked the relationship. That you're not going to be asked to leave. That you're not going to be kicked out and asked to leave because of one eruption. <laughs> you know, it, it's really very, very precious. And of course, the more you practice it, the more you get good at having those miraculous mind shifts in your awareness. It's not that, that you forever are going to have to be speaking these things. You can tell when they start to come up, and you can start to tune into presence and just say, Oh, please be with me, take this from me. You know, it's not, there's no, nothing special about saying the words. You don't get any brownie points or, 
or anything for that. You're not any more special or different for doing it. But it's just symbolic that if you've got dark thoughts and you're not afraid to hide with your trusted brother and sister, then you're not afraid to hide them from the Holy Spirit. If you can do it with a brother and sister, then you can do it with the Spirit. And if you're afraid to share it with a brother and sister, and you want to stuff it back down and hide it again, it means you're afraid to give them over to the Holy Spirit. So, in one sense, how we relate to our brothers and sisters, how we live in relationships and in community, is a direct reflection of what's going on in our consciousness. How willing are we? How trusting are we? Will you still love me if I let the shadow come up? Not that you're even trying to do it, but it's like there's a, there's a sense of, I need, I need help in this. I need to hold your hand. I need to, to trust. And there's a workbook lesson in the Course that says, I trust my brothers who are one with me. Jesus is actively encouraging us, encouraging us to trust our fellow human beings and say, it's going to go much faster if you trust your hum human beings and your friends instead of running away, hiding. It's, it's really powerful. It's like a huge speed up. Hey, Maria is here. I can tell it's almost lunchtime. <laughs> My ride has showed up. <laughs> My wheels. <laughs> and David. Yes. Hey, another David. Good to see you guys. Hi there. We've just watched a little clip from Fifty First Dates, and yeah, we talked about exposing the air and trusting our brothers and sisters, and we're not in this alone, and all kinds of fun things. And this is our little friend Angel here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's on the right. It's a long way up. So this is to me, it's exciting because it's like it's just an invitation from the Spirit to like a whole new way of living. Of when we look at the things, the tools we have in our life, the people we have in our life, we can make smart choices. We can say, now I value the love that's in my heart. I value my opening heart, expanding and unfolding. I want to surround myself with everything that is conducive to my healing. Yes? So, is that, I'm in a place right now where I'm going to walk away from a relationship I have with someone. And I don't want to feel bad about it. It just, it's, it's maximized. And, talk about that. Just, it's done. But there's this guilt that I should, you know, who do I think I am? The ego wants to tell me. But it's not, I'm not serving him, and he's not serving me in any way. It's interesting because I have a Facebook friend who is in the exact, exact position you're in right now, the exact circumstances, completely. And um, she ended the relationship, she moved to another, state, and um, she moved in with her, her daughter and her daughter's boyfriend, who had this real authentic relationship, where they're just, they just got into it, and it's just so, they came out of, out of a 12-step program, and they're so authentic, and they share all the feelings, and there's not only the people-pleasing, sticky stuff, just like, it's a vibrantly healing relationship. And she moved right in with them. <laughs> She's like, whoa, this is great. <laughs> She's like, I feel like three of us are now in the relationship, you know, because it's so, such a swirl of healing. And then she said, I still had some of this lingering guilt, like, you know, I could have done something differently, or just shouldn't give up, and you know, all the different things, and this and this and this. And then she said, I, I was, Watching one of your um, of your movies, I think it might have been the the Dark City movie where I, I do teaching the quantum, where you go so much into the holy instant, so much into the present moment, that you really have an actual experience that the 
those memories of this with this person and you and this and this, that they actually never happened. Mm -hmm. Ever happened. Mm -hmm. That they all were part of a projection of, of bodies and relationships that the ego had projected solely for the purpose of keeping the mind guilty. With no other purpose except keeping the mind feeling like it was guilty and afraid and shamed, anxious and so forth. And that's really what the teachings of the Course are, is that you don't forgive your brother for what he did to you, you don't forgive yourself for what you did to your brother, you don't forgive your brother for what he or she should have done that they didn't do, or that you should have done that you didn't do, the coulda, woulda, shouldas. That's not forgiveness at all. It's actually having an experience that it actually never happened. And she's, she, we did a, one of those Skype call, or not Skype, but Facebook calls you can do now with Messenger. And she was just like, oh my God, I can't believe it. I'm just, I feel so happy, oh my God. Because it was this lingering, hanging thing that was hanging over her. A little bit of the coulda, woulda, shoulda shadows that we're still trying to say that. And she was feeling like, oh my gosh, I'm finally experiencing just these glimmers of how free it feels to not hold the past against my brother, my sister, this man that she had dated. To not hold the past to feel the maximal learning occurred, to feel free, to, to truly live in such a vibrant way. And so she was just so happy, she was saying, and even she said, and even me calling her on um, Facebook Messenger, she said, and you seem to be a man, <laughs> which is really good, because I've always had a, an issue with telling men what I really felt in my heart always like somehow held back. She said, but I don't feel that with you. Is it okay? Can I just share anything and feel it's all part of the healing? And I said, yeah, yeah. And she said, oh, I'm gonna love this. This is great. Because it's a whole new way without kind of having that hesitant hesitation of holding back. Like, oh, don't want to rock the boat. Oops. Can't say that there, oh that, no, I can't say that. To have to keep discerning that, and just let the Spirit come through you, and if there's something to say, let it be said. And then, also get so, have such an integrated, healed mind, that everything you think and say and do, is aligned with your Creator, with the Source. So it's more like you're broadcasting to the whole universe. You don't even know what gossip is. You don't even know what saying something behind somebody else's back is because of that healing. Mm. Look at the Gospels, you know. If you read the Gospels, and you know, I always like reading the Bible and the New Testament because they would put Jesus' words like in red. Mm -hmm. yeah. Did you ever notice that the red words are never gossipy? <laughs> He's never gossiping. He never gossips in the, in the New Testament, I thought. That's why they were red. They're helpful. His words are healing. Let's go into some subtleties. Do you notice that Jesus, he never was really critical so much of people. He was, he was exposing a belief system. And he, when he would say things like, let the dead bury the dead, he was saying, let those that are invested in the ego be concerned with deaths and graves and so forth, follow me. I, I always think that was one of the most loving things he could say, you know, was let the dead bury the dead, follow me. Because this was eternity speaking. If eternity is speaking to time, it's like don't waste yourself with more loops in time. Give yourself the full glory of eternity. And I also noticed that Jesus never really use compliments. You know how human beings are always complimenting each other. You know what the flip side of a compliment is? It's a criticism. That's getting pretty subtle because we're starting to get to the point where we start to realize that divinity is spirit extending spirit. And we're getting beyond this idea that we have to judge the world positively or negatively. Because the positive judgments are just as harmful in awareness to peace of mind as the negative ones are. 
you, it's a whole continuum there. You know, so many spiritualities have taught us you just have to eliminate all the negative. As if we can just grab on and be positive. But, but it, it, you have to let the whole thing be swept away by the Holy Spirit. He was so there for all the apostles. He was so there for every single person he met on the street. But he really wasn't complimenting or criticizing. You never heard him say, you know, hey Peter, nice hairdo. <laughs> or, you know, you, you don't hear him give the positive judgments or the negative. If you really read the red, the red wording, it's so divine. It's like it's, it's like it's spirit speaking. It's not a man. And, and it's more than the words. I think what we're going for is we want to have that attitude that we're so focused on the, in the presence of love that everything and everyone that we experience is touched by that love. And that's what we're doing here, you know. The beautiful song, the, the baby dancing to the song, calling on the Holy Spirit. The more that the chant called on the Holy Spirit and welcomed the Holy Spirit to flood the room. You see the baby got louder and the baby was dancing more expressive, more expressive, because it was almost like a barometer of just the love and the, the, the blessing that was flowing through all of us. And that's what we want our whole life to be. We just want everything to be lit up around us, reflecting that. The moment offers that, doesn't it? Yeah, the present moment offers present that. Moment offers that. So, I mean, the way that movie was kind of cool because she was so fresh and without any past yeah. every day. Yeah. When she watched the video for the first time, she just had, you know, there was a bit of reaction. But there was, on her face, it was almost like this look of like, oh, Thank you. Thank you for not pretending anymore. Mm. Isn't that great that we can have relationships that don't involve pretense? Mm. You know? That we feel trusting enough to just let whatever needs to come, come. That the strength of our love can handle anything. Without that, get out of my life. Without that judgment, judgment without that rejection. To be able to hug somebody, to be able to hold somebody when they're angry. Because underneath the anger is hurt. They're really hurting. They're crying out for love and acceptance. And that's how the Spirit comes through, with just that holding. Let somebody hold, be held, let them shake, let them cry. And even if they seem to be, like, violent, you know, give them the space. Give them the space for that. We've all been through that. We don't. We, should, we don't need to intervene there and try to to make them wrong or point a finger. It's just that's our opportunity to be gracious and spaciousness. And when you say to give them space, does that mean physically leave their field to let them sit with whatever emotions arising? Or to actually be in the presence of that negativity or whatever is being purged? To hold space and be able to transmute that? Yeah, that's where it's, it's, you really have to follow your guidance, because there are times when clearly it's just time to time out. Um, like they even use with children, when children get really angry and sometimes violent, the teacher will go, time out, and they know what, the, what it's for, because they need time to cool off. That anything would, would like trigger or make it worse. And there are occasionally times, especially if, if it's a a dear friend, and there's a lot of, of trust and everything like that, when just to be held can help to start to let that go away. I would say those are kind of rare. A lot of times you do, you are guided to kind of back off. And I remember one time, um, it's just all in our, our trust and our confidence with the Spirit, because one time a friend of mine said, she said, I had a dream with you, David, and we were we were both flying on um, flying up through the clouds on these like magic carpets, and I had a pink one and you had a blue one, and we were both flying, flying, flying all around in the sky. And then she said, "I looked down and I saw it was a gang war going on." She looked down and she said, "Look, oh, she was a gang war." And so she said to me, "Quick, let's 
fly in the other direction. And I said, no, let's go down. So <laughs> we both flew in our little blankets, the pink and blue blankets down there, and when we landed, she, she was kind of afraid. And she said, and I threw my blanket out, and it was this big blue blanket, and it just kind of flew and landed on, on everyone, and everyone turned peaceful. Wow. <laughs> and then another dream a friend of mine had with me, she said, we were, we were in a dangerous place, and there was all these buildings and hiding places, and there was all these dangerous forces, and she said, I just followed you. Sometimes we would watch, sometimes we would drop down and go down, and, and it was almost like one of these spy movies where you have to just make all these discerning moves. And she said, I was just staying real close. And that's, I think, our walk with the Spirit. We want to be so connected, so in presence, that whatever the situation comes up, we, we don't rely on our past learning. We rely on our present trust. One man, who was a Course in Miracles student one time, he was also a clown, a professional clown, and he was working at a circus in uh, Philadelphia, and he came out after the circus, and he was in full clown gear. He was going to walk home in full clown gear. So he was walking through the streets of Philadelphia, and a, a street gang saw him with switchblades, and they came up, and they completely encircled him. My friend said, and I was completely encircled, and they brought out the blades, you know, to, to come and to cut me and everything. And they started coming in closer and closer and closer. And I said, what did you do? And he said, I just cried out, Jesus help me, in my mind. He didn't say it, he just, in his mind, because it was one of those situations where he didn't know what to do. Because he was in, and as soon as he cried out, Jesus help me, he noticed that his body fell to the ground, and he started cooing and making baby noises. Oh and the whole group went, what? They stopped. They went, man, this guy is crazy, man. They, they perceived he was mentally ill, apparently, and they <laughs> fled the scene. And that's how he was helped. And, and that's a good example of don't try to use your past learning mm -hmm. when you are confronted with a situation where it seems hopeless, is cry out for help and mean it. And he did mean it. And the falling to the ground and making the baby sounds, he said, oh my God, it saved my life. Mm -hmm. And it was just that example of, that's why we cultivate our, our connection with spirit. Because who would think to do that? Who would think in a million years <laughs> to do that? But that was the most defenseless thing to do. Jesus always says, in my defenselessness, my safety lies. And he just, yeah. he dropped down, maybe whatever, whatever he's in fetal position or whatever, and making the baby sounds was the perfect thing. Okay, it's lunchtime, and we'll be back at 3 o'clock. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.